Hi folks, so we're going to continue with the session seven. This is the part on conditional independence or what it is called a disseparation, okay? So let's say like I have a, a graph and I want to go from, or I want to have two, two particular variables and I'm interested in knowing whether those two variables are independent or not given uh, uh, a set of other variables, okay? And what we are going to do is like, we're going to check for paths within the, the, the graph. And we are going to say like, if my graph has some, some of those paths, then I can say like, if these uh, two variables are independent or not, or conditional independent or not, given the, the evidence, the, the value E, okay? So I'm going to ask that, uh, that what is the D separation? of two of A and B given some evidence E, okay? So this can be a set of, of nodes and these uh, are my, my, uh, my points, okay? So there are like three simple rules to, to do this, okay? Um, one is like if the path I will call P a path between um, P is a path um, between A and B, okay? And what I will ask is if P contains a chain Uh, or a sequence of, of the following shape, some S of M to T, and this M is in my evidence, then I will say that they are de-separated, okay? And we can see this because if my, my variables, my S and M and T, uh, I have this implication, like I have this chain, this means that T depends on M and M depends on S, right? Because these are the, the chains that we have in the graph. So I know that my density of these three nodes, my SMT, is what? Is P of T given M times P of M given S times P of S, right? Because I am just assuming this from, from the start. Now, um, from my condition part, I know that P of uh, S and T given M, because M is in my evidence, right? So this is the, the thing that I'm conditioning on, right? I know this. So if this holds, that means like I can apply the transformation of the, or the definition actually of the conditional here, right? But what is my what is my joint? My joint is this thing over here that I just defined. So if I plug it in, I have this PDT given M times PM given S times PS over PS. Uh, sorry, PA. Uh, yeah, PM. So <clears throat> what I have now, right? Now, if you see over here. This thing over here well, is what? Is the definition of um, S given M, right? Because I, I can just apply base over here. So this is just the conditional. So this is P of T given M times P of S given M, right? Now I just arrived to the independence of these two variables. So if you remember two variables are independent if the joint is the multiplication of the marginal. So cool, I just show that if this chain exists, these two values will be independent. Um, excellent, so moving forward, what is the, the second rule? If P contains uh, what we call a fork or a tent because due to their shape, so a fork or a tent, 
and it is in, in this particular uh, <laughs> shape. So MS or MT, right? And if M is in the evidence again. So in this particular case, uh, we can assume the same thing. So how can I show that this actually holds, right? So if S and M, M imply S and T, then how is my density, right? I can just do the same thing again as before. I'm just saying that S depends on M and T depends on M, right? And times my, uh, my M. So basically this is just uh, P of S given M, P of T given M times P of M. And you may be tempted to say like, oh, I have the two marginals, so they are uh, independent, but you should be careful because you still have this PM over here. So they are not just the multiplication of the marginal, so you are not done. Um, so you need, still need to show that this um, conditional over here holds. So you have the same conditional as, as, as before, but now what happened? Your density, your joint change, right? Your joint is now this PS, PS given M times PT given M times PM over PM. Now you can cancel this and now you have your independence, right? So now you are sure that those two are, were independent from each other. And finally, <clears throat> the third property that you are looking for, it's a collider. So you need to see that P contains what is called a collider. So a collider is the opposite of the tent. You come from S and land in M and you come from T and land on M. And now you want that M, it is not in the evidence, okay? Nor the descendant, descendant of M. So those shouldn't be on the evidence either, okay? And you can show this in a similar fashion. So if this collider happens, so if S and M and T, my density is what? My density will become P same in T. This is M given S and T times P of S, P of T, right? And if I do the same thing as before, I, I just take my, my conditional and this is given M. So if M is in this evidence over here, what will happen? If it is, then I have my definition of conditional. And then I have this PM given S and T, PS, PT over PM. And there is no way that I can change this without knowing anything else about this form. So I cannot show that these two things are independent, okay? However, if I assume, for instance, that uh, S and T are independent because I don't have any, any M in, in, the, in the evidence, it is straightforward that these two are, are independent, right? Because this M does not does not uh, control any of those two because they are uh, the parents of, of, of these two things, right? And if I condition with, with respect to M, it won't matter because uh, these, these two are not there, okay? So this is the, the idea of what they call explaining away, right? In, in, in such a way that if I, if I have two coins that I toss, then both coins are independent from each other and they don't they are not related to to anything but now if i tell you that i'm observing the sum of those coins and the sum is some particular value then because i'm observing this sum i made those two variables independent from each other right so that is like the 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 whole idea on these independent uh properties okay and we can try to put this in a, in a more concrete form. 
So assume that we have this particular graph. So we have, for instance, um, one node over here, another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, and finally this one over here. So bear with me, I, I will name these. I should probably need to write this before, but I didn't, so yeah. X2, X3, X5, X4, X6, X7, okay? So what we say, for instance, I may ask, is X2 independent of X6? Or given which subset of nodes will make these uh, both things independent, right? So if you remember, we have these three rules. So I need to have a chain and I need to observe whatever is in that chain. So if I go in this way, for instance, X5 is directly between that chain. So if I observe X5, then I'm kind of out of the of, out of the way, right? So I can directly block it. So I can I can use X5 here. And also I can observe, for instance, um, if I try to go this way, I have some some collider in here, right? Because I have X4 and X6. So if I have X7 in my in my evidence, then these won't be uh, uh, independent, right? So I cannot add X7 over here. Um, I may add X4. Yeah, it won't it won't add anything to to it. I, I may add it or not. Uh, for instance, I also can add X1. But if I add X4, um, it won't change anything, right? Because X7 is still blocking this, this path. And in this way, I have X1 or X3 that are blocking me, right? So I can add any of those because then I will have another chain here and that will avoid my, my process. So for instance, I can do this one with X1. And these blocks, particularly that, that path over there. Um, similarly, you may ask, for instance, uh, what about, I don't know, X4 and X3? Given what things they are independent, right? So again, we can do some similar, similar ideas. And I can just go and do some path over here. So for instance, if, if I move over, over this side, I, I will need to block, for instance, X2 over here to avoid uh, going here or going there. So that is uh, a particular interesting one. And uh, over here, I may block either X7 or X6 to go to X3, right? So one of those may be uh, useful, but remember like in here we have this collider and since we have the collider, actually I don't need to worry because this path is already blocked as long as X7 is not there. So I don't need to, to worry much about this. And this is like another collider, so I can just simply remove it. So one small set is this one and another one may be uh, removing X1 over here to avoid avoid coming back, right? like adding more more information to it, like doing X2 and X1 or X2 and X5 and so on and so forth. But we don't need to, to worry about the minimum one because I'm not asking for, for that one. And if you're interested, for instance, in finding kind of a recipe to do these, uh, these paths or finding them, you may do this using uh, what it is called a directed local Markov property. So, these directed local Markov property. And it is a way of defining localities with respect of the neighbors. So I can define a way, for instance, that some node T in my graph is going to be independent from non-descendants Oh, this is an ND, non-descendants of T. And I will remove the parents, right? Because it is obviously depending on the parents. 
given the parents okay so if I know my parents what I can tell about the other nodes right as long as I have these non descendants I will be um, independent from them without any checking so these non descendants are defined as the complement of the whole nodes that I have and I'm going to remove myself and my descendant so that means like any node that comes from me I will I will remove it so in this case for instance from x5 descendant of x5 is x6 and x7 so I'm going to remove these two I'm going to remove myself so everything else is a non-descendant and then I need to remove my parent right so I will need to remove x2 and x3 and that is a, another way of, of computing that. And there is another property that derives directly from this one. And it comes from the order mark uh, from the um, order Markov, if you remember. So if I have some particular order in my graph and that order comes from the parents to the children, then I can say the following. I can say that my T is also independent for any predecessor so anything that comes before me according to that order minus the parents right because again I depend on them given the parents and in here you define the predecessors as some subset of the non-descendants so this also uh, helps a lot and this comes from the order Markov property right and <clears throat> in this case I wasn't asking for instance for the smallest one right like as I was telling you may add some other nodes and still get some independence still but you may not need them and for instance, you may ask, what is the smallest set? So that is called a Markov blanket, and it's also a useful uh, concept because sometimes you may hear it. And this Markov blanket, it is the smallest set, the smallest set, such that uh, makes T independent from the all other nodes. And that is really nice because you have a way of, of finding that. So this mark, uh, Marco blanket, it is an MB of T and it is defined as the childs of T um, union, the parents of T union the coparents of t and a coparent is simply all the parents that are all the nodes that are parents of my children too so we can define it as the set of the parents of the children's right such that these children's should be yours your children right <clears throat> so you can actually check that for instance if you want to step in, in some in some particular node over here let's say like I want to ask what is the Marco blanket of six so I need to say what is the smallest uh, set of nodes that will make me independent from everything else so it is my children so the children of 67 my parents so the parents of um, six are five and three and my co-parents so from my children I want to see who are their parents so four and five four and five is already there so this is the smallest set that will make me independent from from the rest right so obviously I cannot be independent from five and three because they are my parents but it will make me independent from two and one so it is a, a simple way of, of trying to go over there.
right? And you can play with these uh, and get more more rules. So these are the basic ideas for the graphical models. As you may see, they may seem obvious at times, but they are really powerful ways of modeling information. They can be really, really helpful when you want to think about the problem. And as I said, for instance, right now we are not interested in finding this structure, but there are ways of finding the structure too. So you may end up only with given a set of nodes and factors I can just try to infer a lot of hidden mo uh, a lot of hidden variables that let me learn some structure over a structure over them and then use them to make some predictions and we use that in a lot of different uh, applications in medical analysis in language and uh, even in videos okay so they are a powerful tool to learn okay so hopefully uh, you get this. If you have any questions, just hit me in the classroom and we will continue on the next chapter, okay?